Hello and welcome to the podcast for Ray Church of the Nazarene. I'm Ben Beckman, Senior Pastor, and I'm glad that you have tuned in to listen to our services and sermons. We would also love to have you join us in person at 410 Blake Street in Ray, Colorado for our Sunday morning worship services that begin at 1045. We also have Sunday school classes for all ages that begin at 945, and our Spanish service begins at 9 a.m. There are also various other activities and Bible studies that you can be involved in throughout the week, including youth group and children's quizzing. Please visit our website at raynaz.com and our Facebook page for more information. We have something for everyone to encounter God with people just like you desiring to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Again, thank you and welcome to our podcast. This week's podcast is the beginning of our sermon series based out of Nehemiah entitled Nehemiah, Rise and Build. This series is going to look at this at the story of Nehemiah and the way that he encountered God in very specific ways that challenged and encouraged him to lead with boldness and courage. Despite the fear, despite the, the things that he was facing, he was able to walk with God and allow God to move and challenge not only him, but the people of Israel. I pray that you're blessed and encouraged and challenged in this sermon series over the next several weeks. If I were there, I would. Our schools are in really bad shape. Someone ought to do something. Any of you kind of relate to some of those? How many of you relate to being really good at complaining or coming up with ways that somebody else ought to be doing something about something? Finger pointing and a couple hands raised. Yeah. Well, I find myself in that group a lot. And um, this morning, as we we are starting a brand new sermon series out of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is actually, um, I was just really challenged in my in my prep this week as, as I was learning more about who Nehemiah was, how how this book was written, how it's connected to Ezra and First and Second Chronicles, and how it tells this story and this narrative about God's people. And God's people at this time are, especially as we look at, at the book of Nehemiah, are incredibly discouraged. They've been exiled, and so there's been groups that have been allowed to go back and, and begin a rebuilding process. But what's been taking place is, is just this prolonged period of, of discouragement. And problems that set in and take place and, and people complaining and, and just nothing really gaining traction or, or not much being done. And so, so I thought I'd start our time together today with, with those questions, with those comments, with those statements that, that we make. We come sometimes approaching things with an attitude of, of, of complaining, an attitude sometimes that things just aren't the way that they should be. And so, so we, we have those things, and, and they build up in us, and then we just complain about it. Well, Nehemiah took a little bit of a different approach, and we're going to look at, at who Nehemiah was and, and, and what he did. And I was actually surprised by a couple of things that I discovered, and I'm excited to share some of these with you today. But some of the things that, that Nehemiah did was, was he... As we work our way through this book, we're going to discover that Nehemiah was, was, was kind of a man of action. He was somebody that, that saw a problem and was willing to jump in and, and see about getting it resolved. And instead of complaining, instead of taking the easy route, he took the route that was, that was often very difficult. And it was difficult not only because he had to overcome probably some of his own desires to respond in a certain way, but he was dealing with other people's responses and, and their complaints, not only towards him, but towards God. And so this series that we're going to look at, it's, it just tells the story of Israel. Jeremiah prophesied how they were going to come out of exile. And they weren't seeing these things unfold in the way that they expected. So, complaining sets in. Discouragement sets in. We're going to also look at the ways that God invites all of us to participate in building his kingdom. So I want to give you kind of a, 
kind of a quick bird's eye view of, of the themes that are going to come out of, of Nehemiah. And we're going to just talk about those through this, this overarching theme of, of where we see God moving in our church today. So we're looking at what God was doing then, but also looking at it in the lens of where, what do we do with this and how do we move forward with this? So one of the first things that comes about, one of the first themes that becomes evident is this theme of, of vision. So although the Jews, they completed the temple in 516, that takes place in the book of, of Ezra. Um, Zerubbabel led a group back and they began rebuilding the temple. But the city walls still remained in shambles for the next 70 years. And these walls represented power, it represented protection, and they represented beauty to, to the city of Jerusalem. They, they were part of the culture of the time. They were also desperately needed to protect the temple from attack and to assure the continuity of worship. And God put the desire to rebuild the walls in Nehemiah's heart, giving him this vision for this work. So that's the first thing we're going to talk about. We're going to spend a lot of our time there today. Prayer is also another theme that comes out very early in this book. In fact, um, in Nehemiah chapter 1, we capture this, this first prayer of Nehemiah. But both Nehemiah and Ezra repres- responded to problems with prayer. When Nehemiah began his work, he recognized the problem, immediately prayed, and then acted in response. Leadership is another theme that comes out of Nehemiah. So Nehemiah dis- demonstrates this excellent form of leadership. He was spiritually ready to heed God's call. He was spiritually ready to lead God's people. He used careful planning. He used teamwork. He used problem solving and courage to get this work done. Although he had tremendous faith, he never avoided the extra work necessary of good leadership. Another theme that comes out are problems. We can all relate to this. We all got problems, right? After the work began, Nehemiah faced scorn, slander, threats from enemies, as well as fear, conflict, and discouragement, and all of those things he experienced from his own people. So it wasn't just outside, it was inside. And all those, these problems were difficult, they didn't stop Nehemiah from finishing the work. And at the end of Nehemiah, we see this call to repentance and this revival and this renewal of God's people. So although God had enabled them to build the wall, the work wasn't complete. It represented what God was doing in their hearts and lives. And it wasn't complete until the people rebuilt their lives spiritually. And Ezra instructed the people in God's word. Ezra comes back and leads this part of the renewal. As they listened, they recognized the sin in their lives, they admitted it, and they took steps to remove it. So you kind of get this big picture of what we're looking at over the next few weeks as we look at Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, was called to, to respond to the stirring that God put within him to deal with a problem that he saw. And so as, as we spend time today... We're going to look at the stirring that God did in Nehemiah's heart. We're going to look at the way that he responded to the stirring that that God did in his heart with the way that he prayed. And then we're going to look at the way that Nehemiah responded by using what he had. So let's get started. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to start with the first four verses. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant and the, and the survived. We start that sentence again. I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province, are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. 
Verse 4. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So as we stop here and we look at these first four verses, I want to kind of present to you a little bit of who is Nehemiah. Because I, I think that's important for us to have some context of who he is so that as we look at the way that he responded, at least for me, it kind of created an aha moment. So who is Nehemiah? Well, if you fast forward a little bit here at the end of verse 11, he says it right there. He was a cupbearer to the king. This tells us a couple of things about who he is. So it, it testifies that of his loyalty and his integrity because these, this type of position was not held by somebody that the king obviously couldn't trust. He was someone who had demonstrated loyalty and integrity. It, it, it attests that, that he's a servant. In those times, cupbearers could be better thought as, as a type of butler. So not only did they uh, taste test the wine before it was served the king to see if it was poisoned or not, or food or other things, but his job description could also be described as other duties as required, which would mean whatever the king uh, would ask of him to do, he was expected to do. So he's a servant. So this relationship to the king, it comes with some authority. He's recognized, and, and it allows him to go into Judah, Jerusalem, a little later on as its governor to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So this position that he held brought with it some authority from the king. We know that that he is a Jew, and he's part of this exiled group, but, but he had never been to Jerusalem. He was born in captivity. So he has just kind of been brought up and, and adjusted to this Babylonian culture. It was part of who he was. But he had never lived in Jerusalem. But yet we see here that he loved this, this homeland. He wanted to return to Jerusalem to reunite the Jews and to remove the shame of Jerusalem's broken down walls. This would bring glory to God and restore the reality and the power of God's presence among his people. I found that interesting, that even though he'd never been there, he had this great desire to return there. He had this great desire to be a part of what God wanted to do to restore who Jerusalem was. We know, as, as we've, if you're familiar at all with Ezra, that he wasn't the first of the exiles to return to Jerusalem. As I mentioned, Zerubbabel had led the first group back in 538 B.C., more than 90 years earlier. Ezra followed with the second group in 458. And here Nehemiah was, ready to lead the third major return to Jerusalem. And when he arrived, I didn't know this, it was a three-month journey for him to travel from where he was, serving the king, to where Jerusalem was. Three months. He saw, he saw this completed temple. He arrives and he sees the completed temple. And, and he begins to become acquainted with those that, that are there. And he begins to understand a little bit. I'm kind of getting ahead. We're, I'm giving you, again, a kind of a, a summary view of what's taking place. But as he arrives, he sees this completed temple, but he sees the city in, in, in disarray. And not just physically, but the people as well. What the Jews lacked, as he saw, was leadership. And there was no one to show them where to start, what direction to take, as they were called to rebuild this city. So Nehemiah, as he arrives, begins this kind of a back-to-basics type program. If you guys have ever played sports, especially in high school, the first couple of weeks are what? Drills, right? It's getting back to the basics. And that's what Nehemiah is doing as he returns and he's, he's gathering this group of people. He's bringing them back to the basics of who they are, their identity of who God had called them to be, and where God had promised him he was taking them moving forward. So Nehemiah kind of begins to represent this model of a committed, God-honoring type of leadership. So my question is, thinking about who Nehemiah is, is why would he get involved with a place 
that he had never been to. I want you to think about that for a minute. Why would he get involved with a place that he had never been to? I discovered that that Nehemiah, he's what we would kind of term today in the church as a layman. He was not a a priest. He was not uh, an administrator. He was not, he did not come from any any type of, of, of a patriarch, a judge, or any of the prophets that we tend to see throughout scripture that led God's group of people. He was a layman. And he comes to Israel with the, 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 this authority that was granted to him by the king, the secular king. But as Nehemiah testifies, through the gracious hand of God. So why would he lead if this wasn't his job? So two questions for you I want you to think about. Why would he get involved with a place that he'd never been to? And why would he lead if it wasn't his job? How many of us tend to look at problems that we're facing or problems happening in the world around us? We can complain about them, but we kind of give up the excuse of, well, it's, it's not my job. It's somebody else's job to worry about that, right? We tend to kind of dismiss some of those things, ways to get involved because, well, that's, that's above my pay grade or that's, that's beyond what, what I can do. We dismiss it. Something interesting that I noticed about Nehemiah, if, if you are to understand his position as cupbearer, although it did come with some, some danger to it, there was a lot of comfort to it as well. He was well taken care of. He had a place to live, plenty to eat. He had wealth that came with that. So why? Why would he lead if it wasn't his job a place that he'd never been to, and to give up his position, his wealth. Some of us, we tend to get involved with a problem or we tend to uh, allow ourselves to to be involved with something when it begins to kind of step on the toes of our comfort or our interests, our wealth, right? Then all of a sudden, I've got a dog in the game. I've, I've, I've... I've got a reason to respond now because now it's it kind of hits home. But as we as we read in these first four verses, we see here that Nehemiah was moved by the reports of his brothers and the others that had come back from this journey. And he couldn't ignore it. Verse four says that he mourned, he fasted and he prayed. And as I read that. I don't know if it was the Lord or not, but I felt asked and challenged. When was the last time something stirred my heart in that way? Where I fasted, where I prayed, where I mourned. See, these were something that there was a deep concern of, of, of Nehemiah. It was something that, that, that God used and it just stirred in his heart. and He couldn't ignore it. He couldn't let it go. So we see here. That Nehemiah first allowed God to move his heart to get him involved. Let's read verses 4 through 11. This begins this prayer of Nehemiah. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees, and the laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. <clears throat> 
They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to this prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant great success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So following the dates given that Nehemiah has here, and according to different scholars, it's estimated that Nehemiah fasted and prayed for approximately 90 to 150 days, expressing this sorrow for Israel's sin and his desire that Jerusalem would again come alive with this worship of the one true God. In this prayer, Nehemiah demonstrates a few different things that we want to look at. One was praise. We see that in the first several verses. And thanksgiving. It moves to repentance. And not just repentance of, of the people as a general sense, but, but also as, as, as his part that was played in it as well. So we see praise and thanksgiving. We see repentance. He brings this specific request that actually um, comes to, to light here in, in chapter 2. The specific request of what he wants God to do and this commitment to be a part and, and be committed to God in this way. This prayer that Nehemiah gives is, is incredibly heartfelt. It identifies his heart towards God. It reveals the way that, that he had this relationship with God despite being where he was what he had to do in serving the king. He never, even though he's brought up in in Babylonian captivity, he didn't lose the essence of what it was of of God's people. They had told stories. They had to have. They had to have testified about who God was and the promises that he gave them. So he had this relationship. And it's interesting, too, that here at the beginning it said that he fasted. And prayed. That was uncommon in this for this type of, of a prayer and situation. Usually it was tied to some type of festival or sacrifice or something like that. So for him to, to fast and to pray and to mourn about this means that, that God was stirring deeply within him. We see that he prayed specifically for success in what God was stirring him to do. Not just for the strength to cope with the problems that are going to come a little bit later on, but for the success of what God would do in the midst of this first step of faith of approaching the king and asking him if he can leave. I want to call attention to a couple of these elements of the prayer. And I hope I'm not boring you. Um, this last week, there, you guys, there's so much in here and trying to, to kind of narrow this down to get you to see some of these things. Um, it was hard. And so I'm, I'm trying not to, to bore you with, with a lot of these details, but I, I hope you see the importance of it because it brings the context of what Nehemiah was doing and what God had called him to do and where we lie in the middle of all of this. So I hope you hear this today. The contents of Nehemiah's prayer. Again, I mentioned it was the acknowledgement of God's greatness. So he faced this great situation that he knew he couldn't face or deal with by himself. But he knew that, that through God, all of these things would be possible. And he began this prayer by acknowledging that fact. O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God. His use of Lord reveals of this covenant relationship that not only he had, but that God had with Israel. So it, it testifies to this relationship, the words that he used of addressing God. He refers to God of heaven and refers to God as great and awesome. Both of these things refer to God in his sovereignty and are, and are mindful of God's power and his majesty. So a God as great and as mighty as this surely can answer this prayer. He moves to a prayer of confession. And I'll try to move through this quickly. This prayer of confession 
for the sins of the people of Israel and himself. He acknowledged that he, Nehemiah, shared in the responsibility of Israel's disobedience to God's laws. In this prayer, he said, I confess three times. And he placed himself in Israel in this submissive attitude under the Lord, calling himself again God's servant. That's familiar territory to him. He served the king in this way, and he's serving God in this way as his servant. Then it moves to this request that Nehemiah has for God's help. Nehemiah, it seems to take on this sense that he's reminding God. But it's not to remind God of something that he had forgotten. It's leading him to to this act. It's leading him to, to this place where he recognizes again who God really is and what he had promised to do. So sometimes when we pray, we're reminding God of our situation sometimes. God fully knows. But sometimes it's a part of us reminding of our stature in who God is and who we are. And so that's, that's the role that, that Nehemiah is playing here. Um, Nehemiah asks that God would respond to hear this prayer, to give your servant great success today. Nehemiah comes before God knowing that, um, that all of this is dependent upon him. It's all dependent upon God opening these doors and allowing him to do what he needs him to do. Nehemiah began this time again through fasting, through prayer, 90 to 150 days. Something that God had stirred within him so much to move him to that type of commitment. I've tried many times to fast and to pray, and it's easy to forget. It's easy to to lose sight of, of whatever it was. You lose the, the desire. I mean, I'm confessing that. Maybe for some of you, that's not the case. But Nehemiah models a response that I think I know convicted me that I need to respond to something that God has called me to do with the diligence, with the urgency, with that deep stirring, that I don't lose heart, that I don't get distracted, that I focus on what God has called and led me to do. So we see through Nehemiah that God stirred his heart, that he responded in prayer. And then I want to... Point your attention to the last verse of chapter 1. Nehemiah used what he had. Here in verse 11, the last part of verse 11, he writes, I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah realized his situation was what God wanted to use to accomplish his purposes. And I, I make note of that because I feel like sometimes our positions, we use where we are in life, the things happening, our circumstances, we use those as an excuse to set ourselves on the sideline or as an opportunity to, to kind of wait this one out. But Nehemiah, sense that God was using that to accomplish his purposes. So I want to ask you that question today as I ask myself this question. Do we see our positions as an excuse to be on the sideline or as an opportunity that God wants to use to work through you? No more excuses. We all have a part to play. As I talked about what a cupbearer was and the responsibilities that came with it, the benefits also came with that. And Nehemiah utilized, leveraged his relationship that he had 
with this king to be able to approach him in a way that nobody else could. Nobody else would be able to have a conversation with the king the way that Nehemiah could. So he didn't use his position or his responsibilities or whatever was happening in his life as an excuse to not be a part. But he saw him as an opportunity. And I was convicted of that question. Do I look at problems and things happening around me as a way to not be involved? Or is God wanting to use those as an opportunity to allow his purposes to be worked out? I want to invite the, the praise team to come up as we close out our time together with the song. So I asked you a few questions today. And, and these questions, they make sense as, as you look at them through what you're facing today, the situations that, that you are in, your relationship with God currently, whatever's happening in your life. These all play a, a part. These all are a principle that we can apply, that we can allow God to stir our hearts to action, that we can respond first by prayer and, and allowing this, what God is stirring in our hearts to motivate us to pray and to be attentive to that. And then allowing God to use where we are, who we are, as an opportunity to be a part of what he wants to do. So I see that happening with each one of us. But this also plays a part in who we are as a church. This plays a part in, as Dwayne mentioned this morning, is he had these, these high school students stand up to pray for. That's a tangible way that we are invited into this process that God wants to do things in people's lives. We all have a part that we can play. We're not too old. We're not too young. We're not too busy. We don't have enough st- Whatever the excuse that we use is, We're going to discover as we move our way through Nehemiah that there's a place for each one. There's an opportunity for each one. And as you work these things out in your life, those also work their way out in the life of the church. And I'm not just talking about Ray Church of the Nazarene, but I'm talking about the church in a more general sense. And it's time for us to be involved What this church needs is, what this country needs is, it's time to move from complaining, and it's time to start seeking what God would have us do in response to what we see happening. And what we notice happening I believe, is a work of the Holy Spirit stirring that within us, moving us to respond. And I think we've been conditioned to ignore those things. And it's time to initiate a holy response. A response sourced in the person of who Jesus is and what he would have us do. A response that's walking with him in his Holy Spirit. A response in the personhood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for the story that we read of Nehemiah and the things that you began working in his life. The sensitivity of your spirit working and stirring his heart. His willingness to be involved despite excuses not to. The dangers not to. That you want to accomplish purposes through us. That you want to rebuild your kingdom. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be submitted to the right agendas. The agenda that comes from you the authority that comes from you to respond to the responsibility that's before us.
So, Father, would you stir each one of us today? Father, thank you for your word. We pray and we ask these things, Lord, in your name. Amen.